Who do we have next? I think we're going into like 15 minute talks now, right? Yeah, we have Chloe coming up here. Yeah. Chloe, yeah, and I think Chloe, Darren and uh, Chloe Darren. Got, Chloe got two slots. Here. I know, I'm jealous. I don't, I don't know. Oh, there she is. She just popped up. Chloe, like. <laughs> wow, that's you have. She has better soundproofing than you do, John. It's right? not as cool, but it's much better. And it's so soft. If I feel like I'm going crazy, I just hit my head on this soft cushion. Does it get so quiet in there? You start to like. I know exactly playing. what it's like. I have some here, so. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right. So like, I saw this. So you, you, I think you're one of the one of a very small percentage of people that actually has two slots at Wild High Confess because we just could not pass this one up. So you have 15 minutes to talk oh about hacker rights. How in the hell are you going to do this? Well, I did a 50 minute talk, so now I'm going to try to condense it to a little bit smaller, but I'll make it entertaining too, because this is going to be entertaining for me to get done within 15 minutes. So, well, I'm going to, I'm going to say you're going to have to have a lot of memes of dogs. So, and then do right. we want to have Who Carrie? You? Aaron? Who told you, John? Who told you? <laughs> yeah, there's plenty. There's plenty of dogs in here. There's dogs throughout the whole thing. I kid you not. This is what I did when I had five minutes of nothing else to do. I'll put That's dogs in every slide. Just memes. And then Carrie's yeah. here too. Carrie and Darren one. are going to jump in and talk about uh, Secure West Virginia real quick. Yeah, for like yeah, two or three minutes. A minute, let's talk about Secure West Virginia. <laughs> we, we got a fun class coming up at, in November, and we've got four four-hour sessions where we're going to be doing over 40 hands-on labs covering Atomic Red Team. Caldera, Scythe, Mortar, and lots more stuff. So we're excited to have you get involved. We've actually got a preview of what it'll be like here at Wild West Hacking Fest. We did a workshop last night, but we're also giving you access to the Atomic Red Team work throughs and labs. And we'll give you access to a Windows 10 machine in Azure. You can RDP to during today and tomorrow. Just DM me on Discord and you'll be able to work through 11 hands-on labs and really get a good feel for how Atomic Red Team can help you develop your detections and responses. She nailed it, everybody. She wow, that was, wow. And that was wow. And we're at the top of the hour. Ready, Chloe? <laughs> Go. Microphone was muted. Let's do it. All right. Here we go. Play from the start. You all can see my screen. Excellent. So today we're going to talk about hacker rights. In the quickest way possible, I've never done it this fast, but I made it very entertaining for you. Maybe you'll catch on what I did exactly. So let's do this. Boom. All right. If you do not know who I am, my name is Chloe Mistagi. I am an InfoSec advocate and activist. I'm also VP of strategy over at Point3 Security, co-founder of Hacking is Not a Crime, which you'll know a little bit more after this. President co-founder of Wosec, founder of We Are Hackers, formerly known as Women Hackers, and podcaster for ITSP Magazines, The Uncommon Journey with Alyssa Miller and Phil Wiley. Also organizer for the Hacker Book Club that meets every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And there is a link I can share later if you request it. That is my URL. You can find anything out about myself inside, outside of InfoSec. And yes, my DMs are open on Twitter and Instagram. Feel free to follow at any time. If you see right there next to my, in the photo right there, you will see two pups. These are both Shebas. This is Sherlock. And this is Luna. And these are my puppies. They're like my children. All right. Let's dive into the good stuff and let's see how fast I can talk. All right. First things first, we're going to go through the current landscape. I, I know this is scary, but we're going to dive in it together. So first thing you need to know is that 60% of researchers don't report vulnerabilities. This statistic was discovered by Amit Elazari, who basically was searching for safe harbor if it's a possibility for the hacker community. The other thing you should know is that HackerOne came out with a 2018 report, and in it itself, they researched their community and surveyed them, and they found that one out of four of their hackers do not report a vulnerability when a company in question does not have a vulnerability disclosure program. If they don't, then it's one out of four will say, I'm not going to, you know, they'll report it. If not, no. The one thing you should note about is that those that did notify the company, they usually do it through email or social media. Our favorite way of usually in the community is the DM on Twitter. But the thing is, is that most of the time these are frequently ignored or misunderstood. So why are hackers scared to disclose? Well, let's be real. Besides 
possibility of being prosecuted as wine, finding contact information, reading policies that were a burden to report vulnerabilities in general. Think about it, it could take hours, days, and weeks sometimes to find the right person and for it to get patched. But the other thing to note about is that even trying to disclose something, sometimes you're not taken seriously. And it should also be noted that even if you're hired to do something, you can still face being prosecuted. So one of the cases that I tend to always wanted to share with people is that the DJI case. So after DJI, the drone manufacturer, they decided to create their own bike bounty program. This means it was on HackerOne, BikeRide, any of those platforms. They decided, we're gonna do our own. So two researchers named Sean and Kevin basically came across it. And for the scope, the bug bounty covered all security issues in firmware, application and servers, including source code leak, security workaround, privacy issue. Kevin then emailed them to just make sure that all those things were in scope indeed. And within two weeks time, DJ finally responded. So it took two weeks. He then reported the vulnerability. He never exploited, he stayed within scope. And the vulnerability itself, they were gonna give him 30,000. But the thing is, is that when he was looking at the contract to receive the funds, it would offer no protection for him. So he decided to walk away because he was concerned about being prosecuted, which makes sense. They saw him as a threat for PR purposes and then gave him, or should I say served him, basically a lawsuit saying that he went out of scope and in tied to the Computer Fraud Abuse Act. So in re- then in return, you said, fine, you want to play this way? I stay within scope. I did all that stuff and you're threatening me? Deal. This is what I'm going to do. He decided to post the entire conversation online on his blog. So just a takeaway, kids, in the end, is that even when you stay within scope and you don't exploit, companies can still manage to prosecute you. So one thing to keep in mind on that. But overall, in general, there's a community consensus that even government organizations and people in general in security, we all know that we need each other and we need to have a way to disclose because disclosing a vulnerability is something that is a must have at this time. It protects people more than ever before. And by having policies and such, it helps everyone. But the thing is, is that we're still lacking trust because there's still this fear of hackers. Because this fear itself was created from images that we see whenever we look up online. If you type in the criminal hacker and ethical hacker, you get the exact same imagery as you could see in this slide. There's no difference. Because there's no difference itself, it leads the community outside of InfoSec, basically the public perception, to still see us in this dark way with hoodies and criminals. But it's not just the imagery, it's also the verbiage being used, the terms being used, the media. And when I mean by the media, I mean the press and also marketing. So press and marketing is what media means. And the thing with that is that even when we see these images of people wearing hoods and hoodies, I mean, hoods and hoodies, you know what I mean, hoodies. And what I meant was the ski mask, God, this is so hard to do fast. Ski mask and whatnot. The one thing you should note about it is that it portrays us as criminals. And it has been for the longest time. This is why the public still sees us as a threat, a fear. And because of that, we have some serious problems until we fix using the term hacker. Instead, use the term attacker because attacker, malicious actor, cyber criminal and criminal, those are folks that go out of scope and exploit. Hackers stay within scope and do not exploit. Because what's happened is now we have this as our result. The mindset set by society, by people in the media is keeping us unsafe and preventing hackers what we do, which is to protect people. More companies are becoming more open to receiving information on vulnerabilities, but still we have 94% of the Forbes 2000 still don't trust us or they're too scared to work with us because companies are afraid of hackers because of what has been pushed out there by the media, that we are criminals. Thus, because of that, they're scared to have any bilateral trust agreements between the hacker community and organizations themselves. This is one of the reasons why even hackers themselves, because organizations don't trust them, so how are they gonna trust the other party? Trust goes both ways, right? 
And because of that's why we have 60% of hackers don't report a vulnerability. Hackers are scared of these outdated laws because these laws are hurting us. They prosecute us. They impact us in such a negative way. And those laws are the CFA and DMCA. Also from interviewing attackers, one of the reasons they decided to move away from ethical hacking was the pay and the constant worry of being seen exactly the same if they were an ethical hacker and still having to face the exact same treatment of possibly being prosecuted, regardless if they were in scope or not. This is also the other reason why, you know, those that are from the dark side join the good side, because, you know, the fear of being prosecuted. But what I want to talk about is I can't talk too much about the laws and everything, but the one thing you should know about the DMCA is not so much of a fear for you to know about. It's something you should be aware of because it creates this chilling effect. But no hackers, to my knowledge, have been prosecuted under DMCA. However, they have definitely been prosecuted by the CFAA. So we're going to dive into that really fast. So the Computer Fraud Abuse Act passed in 1984 has grown wildly outdated. And that it offers prosecutors discretion to threaten huge potential fines and jail sentences for relatively underserving violations of the computer policy. First, the CFAA, as written, punishes exceeding authorized access to a protected computer, a phrase vague enough to inspire some really broad interpretations. Another flaw of CFAA is the redundant provisions that enable a person to be punished multiple times for the exact same crime. These charges can be stacked on one on top of another, resulting in another. Oh, my God. Resulting in a threat of a high cumulative fines and jail time for the exact same violation, which we saw with Aaron Swartz's case. And if you haven't heard about him, do it. You owe it to the community. Everyone in this community should know about what happened to Aaron Swartz and what he had to face. It is so important for us to know about that. It shows the example of why CFA can be so terrible for us. But in general, this in itself, CFA. It allows prosecutors to bully defense into accepting a deal in order to avoid facing a multitude of charges from a single solitary act. It also plays a significant role in sentencing. This immunity of a provision meant to toughen sentencing for repeat offenders of the CFA may in fact make it if possible for defense to be sentenced based on what should be prior convictions, but were nothing more than multiple convictions for the exact same crime. I want to just point out that since 2013, the DOJ has been doing whatever they can to protect ethical hackers. So you don't have to worry too much of the DOJ and federal situations, the CFA. You have to be concerned about companies and local. Local government and companies are the ones that are using the CFA against you. Because if we don't have improvements to legislation, we're going to have a really hard time still to this day. But with improvements in the legislation, we can see and stand in a way where we actually have rights, where we don't have to be afraid to report a vulnerability, where we can actually have a safer world. And But in order to do that, we need to change the public perception of us, who we are, to know that we're not criminals, that we're there, the everyday heroes because it's important for the public to understand because public awareness can bring about public change. And in order to have that, we need to influence the public cycle. So how do you do that? In order to have rights for hackers, we need to get the public on board. In order to do that, we need to dive into these three categories, which we've kind of already touched on before. So we need the press to push for the public to become aware. In other words, we need them to change the language and imagery of a hacker and start using cyber criminals or criminals or malicious actors or attackers for those that commit unethical hacking. Overall, really separate the two groups. In order to help the press, organizations need to be on board with bilateral trust with having vulnerability disclosure programs. By showing they support hackers, the public changes their view in general, plus us as hackers, we start trusting them more. We need both parties to step up to trust each other. We cannot have trust one way. Trust doesn't work like that. It's built over time with two parties. Lastly, to have organization and public opinion push for, to motivate Capitol Hill to get on board and update current legislation that will protect ethical hackers. Overall, we need all three of these to support hacker rights and for it to become a reality. So how do we get there exactly? Well, good thing you asked. Overall, we need to push for awareness of hackers. Who are we? What are we doing? Are we good people? Yeah. How do we let them know? Because the public still thinks of us terrible majority of the time. So we need to change that. 
And how we do that is we need to focus on these five needs. And how we get there, I'm going to need you because we have to work together as a community. So basically, I created a petition. And from a petition itself, it then I co-founded a group called Hacking is Not a Crime, which is a one-stop shop where you can find out how to get involved for getting rights for hackers. If that also means getting in touch with other organizations that we strongly support that are doing everything possible to protect us, but also to bring awareness to the issue. And those organizations are listed, but also it talks about what are hackers? Who are we? Why does this term criminal, like this idea of us being criminals impact us and prevent us from growing as society? So this is a really cool place to be a part of. So if you want to get involved, go ahead, check out hackingisnotacrime.org. It has everything that I talked about and the next steps that you can do and be part of the change. But the main takeaways overall is that we need to push for awareness outside of our community because we're always within our community because that's what happens when people are pushed into a corner. We kind of latch on to each other and love each other because we understand each other and the world's kind of a scary place. So it makes sense. But at the end of the day, if we don't do that, we're going to still stay in the same position that we're in. So we have to do whatever we can to come together to try to change the situation that we're in. That means bringing awareness. And last but not least, like I said, change starts with you and me. We cannot have change unless we both take steps forward. And I know that it's a scary battle to face, and this is a scary topic, but oh my God, look at all the Shiva photos I put in here for you guys. So there are ways how to talk about change and scary things, but still have something positive out of it. And that's what we need to do is have those conversations, get outside of our bubble and really work together. So thank you guys so much for existing. If you have any questions at all, I'm here. I'm in Discord. If you want to DM me on Twitter or Instagram, that is my handle right there. And thank you guys so much for having me. And I cannot believe I got through this talk within 15 minutes. You did. Ah, well, done. less than less than 15 minutes. Ah, that was great. I, I was with yeah. you. You know, you're like, we all got to do this. We got to give hackers rights. We got to, you know, we gotta get out there. We got to we got to we got to let people know that we're not criminals. We got to get the Democrats and Republicans working with each other. I'm like, oh. well, this is that one case where actually this goes across party <laughs> lines. That's the coolest thing right now is that. OK, so. <laughs> The Van Buren versus U.S. case is going to be meeting on November 30th. Everyone needs to know about this case. It, this will impact us. This is the Ooh. first time the CFA is being revisited in the Supreme Court. This can make security research illegal, like officially 100% mm -hmm. illegal. Be on top of it. Be knowledgeable. Contact your legislators. Get involved. This is the time you need to get involved because this is the moment we need to All do right. it. Huh. Awesome. And like you said, you're going to be hanging out on Discord yep. to try to get these people whipped up to yep. start doing some awesome things. We could have ended that. We could have had a last slide with a cat and a dog sleeping together, like what John always talks oh. about, just laying there and be like, hey, we can actually come together, both sides. Like, it's not complete. Put that slide together right now. Like, we can right. <laughs> do that right now. However, my two Shivas, they, they, well, Sherlock hated Luna for like the first 30 days. I'm pretty sure Sherlock was going to kill Luna. But then suddenly she realized, oh, wait, this is a friend for me. And then everything changed. They became best friends. They can't, they're inseparable now. So, hey, everyone. Uh, we, we don't think the next speaker is here. We haven't heard from the next speaker. We, Let's we make that slide up. So, okay. Chloe, if you just want to keep going, right? Sure. Like, just, keep talking about it. Do we, do, we, do we have any questions for, for her on any of this? Has anything come through in Discord or? Then that'd be a great place to launch yeah, off we, from as well. Plenty of time. Oh, there it is, exactly. Jeff. Thank you in the Discord. There it is. We got, we got the dog that thing. So one of the one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, briefly was we need to get out into the community and kind of restructure the opinions of what a hacker is, right? So what are some of the ways that you would recommend people to actually get out into the community um, and positive ways to get them to kind of support what it is we're actually doing? Because I know a lot of us, whenever we talk about what we do, people are like, well, you know, if you guys just stopped hacking, then we wouldn't have all these hackers. And it's like, well, that's not what, how this works. 
Exactly. Or better yet, they take a step back. And when you're like, oh, I'm a hacker or I work with hackers. <laughs> it's always great. Um, but there is definitely ways you could get involved. So hacking is not a crime.org. We have an advocate uh, section. So if people want to get involved, that's one way. Another way is we have a list of organizations or partners that we think are the best organizations out there that are fighting the fight. Those are ones that you want to contact to also find out how you can volunteer and give. That's the most important thing is that we have to come together and working with these orgs are definitely a step forward, but also all of us individually can start taking steps. What I want to do is start, I'm starting a project. If anyone wants to get involved, let me know. But the first thing first is that we need to start telling our personal stories of how hard it is to be a hacker and how this has impacted us in our life and our friends and family members. And so the best way how to do that is to record a video of yourself anywhere between two to eight minutes talking about how you are a hacker, how you got into it, why you do it, and why it's important that hackers exist. That is what we need next. And if you want to be part of that video project, contact me. Because we need to start doing that, like ASAP. So this is this is something I've noticed in my regular just communications with people when I when I tell them who I work for and what they do and everything, is they're kind of like give me this weird look. It's like so companies hire you to break into them. I'm like yeah, and I have a tough time sometimes explaining why that's good. So maybe like I don't know if you have any advice in like just regular communications yeah. with the layman who doesn't understand any of this at all. Like, yeah. what are some good ways to kind of communicate, you know, the, the benefits of this? Because some people might hear it and they might go, well, that just sounds like, you know, you're, you're holding the company's hostages or whatever, you know, you know, illogical thing they might be thinking about it. Yeah, um, I tend to explain it to say to your grandparents. Remember, you always want to frame it as if you're talking to your grandparent or a six year old child sometimes. But the thing mm -hmm. I tend to say is think of hackers as locksmiths and think of a burglar as an attacker. That's a difference. It's nice. I like that. That's something I'll use. I, uh, it almost like we need a, a frequently asked questions called. So somebody asks you what you do for a living. And, you know, what you shouldn't say is don't say I break into places for a living unless you just don't want them to talk to you because that's really effective. The other thing that you shouldn't say is I work on computers because you're going to spend the next hour working mm -hmm. on the freaking fax machine. Yeah. Um, so like this kind of helpful guide, like you talked about the locksmith versus you know, a burglar. I think that that's a great analogy. These are helpful analogies. Wicked Witch of the West versus the Wicked Witch of the East. They're both witches, but I'm the one wearing the high heels and the tiara. So, you, you know, kind of setting that up a little bit. Yeah, definitely on that. We need to, we need to work on it together. And I, and I know the one question I get asked the most the past, I don't know, like two weeks is, well, why don't you guys just keep using the term secure researcher? Why are you using the term hacker? Because you know, even bad people, they they use the term hacker to describe them. And I'm like, yeah, but also those that are doing criminal activity also call themselves security researchers. So there's really <laughs> no winning here. So, I mean, reclaim the hacker thing because that is what you do. Hacking is what you do. It is not a crime to hack. It's a crime when you exploit and when you go out of scope. So don't do that. Um, that's the most important thing. Cool. Very cool. See, Marcello's talking to somebody offline. Yeah, sorry. I'm passing the charger along. <laughs> um, actually, I had a question for you, Chloe. I actually see, um, I think one of the big problems with this, too, are the uh, is how the media, uh, like the stock photos in the media that they like put out on every single hacking article. And I'm not exactly sure how to make them stop that. <laughs> I, I know, like, this is. I think, but but it's. I think it has a lot to do with that too. Like it, it comes down to just edu educating um, the, uh, the the media outlets that this is sort of not acceptable, and y'all need to stop. I'm not sure how to go about doing that, but I pre I definitely agree that that uh, this 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 is getting ri pretty ridiculous. So I recommend people um, attending uh, press training sessions. There are some recording ones. We have it on um, hacking is not a crime. Basically, you want to be you want to be aware that the press is just doing their job. They just don't know better. And that's why they keep using the same terms or they use the wrong imagery. And so letting them know very politely with as much empathy as possible 
So just be like, hey, I just want to let you know that the term hacker is not the correct term. And this is the reason why, and this is how it's impacting this community and people like me. Can you please use this term instead? This would be really good for us because then we're able to change the mindset that the public has so then we can keep doing what we're trying to do, which is to protect you. And so framing it in a way where they understand that you're not trying to correct them and tell them they're wrong, but more like you want to educate them in a way that you're not talking down to them. But um, one way is how you can do it is always, if you see an article and there's an image of a hooded figure or whatnot, you know, send an email or even respond on, a, on Twitter, you know, DM them, be like, hey, I saw your article. It was a great written thing. Just one little thing you need to know about is that the term that you use is actually improper, that this is actually the correct term to use. I'm more than happy to jump on a call with you to talk about this. Yeah. I have done that a few times. And whenever I give comments to the press, I always use the term hacker and attacker when needed. And I always let them know why I'm using those terms. And then I tend to notice that they they didn't know that. And so they changed their articles and all future articles from them on that on that subject. They start doing it correctly because that is what their job is to do is to report correctly. Yeah, I, I guess I guess the. The problem is also that the, I think some of this is also financially motivated because like the, the the imagery of of the hooded hacker, I think, attracts a lot more clicks than, you know, just, you know, oh. me with a Golang plushie or something in front of the laptop. Right. So, yeah, I think I don't. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't even know. I think that's definitely a great idea. But, yeah, it's definitely could, a problem that uh, but I got a fun I, idea. We could, we could do a Twitter thing where we can just literally hashtag while was hacking fest like real hacker. And people can just literally do what they look like and they're a hacker. And it's not like a hoodie or, you know, anything I'm like sorry. that. You could just kind of get perpetuate the idea. But some word yeah, is going to perpetuate these prototypes. <laughs> I, and I always tell people, if you're ever giving a talk or like you're going out in public or you're meeting with the press or anything like that, please don't wear a hoodie. <laughs> like just, I know or, it's if not having, or, or if you're handing out sweatshirts. Don't <laughs> Behind scenes, just don't wear it so people don't see it. And I talk about it a lot, but that hoodie actually means something. I mean, whenever we, we talk about memes all the time, right? And, and I think it kind of loses its meaning. But if you type in hacker, almost all of the pictures have a hoodie yeah. in some. Yep. some exactly. and, and one of the things I think is powerful about that is it does adequately represent what, how people view us, right? It's yep. mysterious. You have no idea what, what it is we're doing. And many times we're faceless. It's unknown. In many ways, we are the magicians of today. And I think demystifying it is, is a huge yeah, step right there. Oh my God. Now you're just going to get us in trouble, Marcello. You're just going to get us in trouble. <laughs> I had to do it, okay? I had to do it. Carry on. <laughs> so one of my favorite stories on that, since we're just killing time now, because I don't think Mike's here. Years ago at RSA, there was an article that popped up. Somebody had gone through and blew up a whole bunch of balloons, the guy Fox masks, and were spreading them all over RSA. Well, that person was Marcus Ranum, Paul Isidorian, and I. Uh, Marcus had all of these different balloons that were made up, and we were just blowing them up and just like giving them to people and letting them blow them up. And it turned into this huge news story. It's like even in this, you know, this sacred place of infosec professionals, you have you have you know hackers are present here and they're making themselves known. And I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but they, they love that story, that narrative, right? And they're gonna latch onto it as much as they possibly. So true. You know, next time when uh, when we can all go to conferences one day, what you can do is make little uh, like business cards. Go to RSA conference floor, the business floor, whatnot. Bring these little cards with you and go to every booth that has images of a hacker in a hoodie and, and just hand them like, hi, I just want to introduce myself to you. I, and I did this in the past. I did this once. I kid you not. The conversation was the most awkward thing in the world, but it was totally worth it. I went out to one of the booths and I was like, hey, can, is your VP of marketing here? And they're like, yeah, let me go get. Do you, do you want to talk to her? I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. And she comes out and I'm like, hey, you see the background that you have of like that that hooded figure? Is that supposed to represent like a hacker or an attacker? And she's like, oh, they, this is a hacker, complete hacker. I'm like, and I'm like, so is that what your idea is of a hacker? And they're like, yeah, they're always wear hoodies. 
They're always behind their screen. They do work in, you know, dark basements and they're always all young guys. And then it's like, huh, do you think there's any women that are hackers? I was just like, no, women wouldn't do this. And it was like. (laughs) 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. (laughs) You'll have like really awkward conversations, but I think it would be really a smart idea for us to start handing out little cards to any of the booths that show us in the wrong light to just remind them that like, hey, you wouldn't have a business without us. And we're also here to protect you. But but I like how I like how they try to outdo them, do each other. Like some will just do the hoodie, right? And then they have the hoodie and the ski mask. And then you'll have somebody with like the hoodie and the gloves. I'm I just waiting for it's like finally the hacker's just going to be this dude walking around in a snowsuit. That, you know, because right. I mean, it's going to progressively get warmer and warmer as time goes on. So, yeah, maybe maybe they'll trust the person more if it has more coverings. Or... More coverings. No, this person, this person's lead. Uh, I know that that person over there has all kinds of CVEs, but this person's playing like like 19 layers. So, um, so any other uh, since, yeah. since, since you have the floor, uh, since the person that was supposed to be presenting has ditched us, what other research? You got more time now. What are some yeah. other research topics and things that you're working on? Sure. If you are right now a company looking into having a vulnerability disclosure program or yourself, you want to revisit the vulnerability disclosure program that you have, I highly recommend checking out disclose.io. They have a really good template and also a really good guidance on how a vulnerability disclosure program should work and what you should include in your policies. And they do have a template too as well. So companies can use it that want to go forward with it. We've I've also seen local governments starting to utilize the template that disclose.io has. So it's a really cool thing to have. The other one you should be aware of is I am the Calvary. They do some really great work and they've been working with legislators to try to change and to bring awareness to the situation. So I always recommend checking out I am the Calvary. The other thing you should be definitely aware, like I said, you need to know who your legislators are because you need to start making those phone calls and sending those emails out to your legislators about the Van Buren versus U.S. case. This is something that all of us in the community need to know about and follow like really well. And make note of all the companies that are saying that security research should be illegal because there are briefs being submitted on behalf of this saying that security research should be 100% illegal right now. So take a look at that. Follow them. Know what companies they are. Keep a list in your head. Wasn't wasn't Maryland looking at some research, uh, looking at some legislation, specifically as it relates to like ransomware, that would have made any any possession or research of malware or anything illegal, which is kind of an overstepping knee jerk reaction law. Yeah. Well, that that's the whole thing because they dealt with the Robin Hoodware, Robinware, mm-hmm. Robin Hoodware. Anyway, it, it took place and it it basically pulled down their like services for like a good couple of months. So it was a really big deal and they had to do a big payout as well. So they're probably just freaking out and all, all that. The one thing you can definitely tell is that most legislation that gets passed or whatnot don't have all parties represented that that new law that's going into effect will impact. And that's one of the issues that we still have to this day in almost every legislation is that all representative parties are not represented at the table. And so that's a huge deal because we're going to keep having issues over and over and over until we have proper representation. But the one thing is that until we can make amendments to the CFA, states will keep doing their own rules. And that's the one thing. So some states are going to be a little bit more on the liberal side of it, trying to protect us. And there's going to be other states that aren't going to try to protect us. But until there's a federal ruling, Basically, all states are at ad hoc of what they want to do. And that's the yeah. scary part that we see with CFA. Hey, Chloe, can you? What, one of the, one of the uh, participants wants to know if can you give us some details around the case, a, a rough sketch? Oh, the Van Buren case? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what happened was that there was this officer, Van Buren who basically had permission to use a database to look up license plates and whatnot. Well, he got paid to look up a license plate. And because of that, there was a ruling basically stating that 
in a very, very loose way of the CFA was saying that he did not, he went, he was unauthorized to do what he did, even though he had permission to use that system because it was part of his job. So then what happened was that he filed it in the Supreme Court, him and his attorneys. And what happened was that basically the CFA is going to be revisited by the Supreme Court to make a decision if anything needs to change about the CFA at all and what to do about this case. Because in other words, we all have somewhat permission, even when we're have like when we go within scope we have permission and whatnot but that could also say that if we are going with in scope that companies can still prosecute us so that's that's the thing about this case is that it's not hacker related it's just about this guy who had access to a database for his everyday work and he utilized it to get some money in his pocket and then he got sued and then what happened was that he decided, like, because they said that he he broke the CFA, basically. He was charged by that. But yeah. And and if you look, there was a brief that was submitted two weeks ago by votes about security researchers being basically quote unquote, I would say that we're bad actors and security research is not needed and it's a criminal activity. And yeah, if you want to read a really good response to that, Disclose.io, they had a bunch of people in the community sign it and send it off of their opinion and their reaction to that letter. But so, yeah. and if you want to get an idea of how long this has been going on, this particular case is very reminiscent to the Randall Schwartz case, where Randall Schwartz was a consultant, I believe, for Intel, and he was doing security auditing. And he actually cracked a bunch of passwords to test the password security. And he got, he got, he got charges brought against him, I think, I think in Oregon. And uh, it took him years to actually get his record expunged. And it wasn't that his record was expunged because he won. It, his record was expunged because it was a white collar crime and it was over 10 years so he could have it expunged automatically. So this is something that we've been fighting for a really, really long time. And on the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, one of the things that, you know, whenever we talk about protected computer systems that gets into interstate commerce, and that's a huge hole. Like literally you can build a computer system in your garage and you would still be a protected computer underneath the interstate commerce. And then I think the, the thing that they're trying to get him under was he exceeded his access, which is in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which once again, how do you even begin to start to define exactly what that is and where that where that line actually is cleanly? Yeah, it's it's definitely one of those things. How is Ren? It, it puts it puts a lot of it's so vague too, and that's the unfortunate thing with the Aaron Swartz case. His was like all about he. That who's familiar with Aaron Swartz? Okay, Aaron Swartz case. You should all know about him. But basically, he broke into J Store. And got uh, like thousands of scholarly research articles out into the public because it was, you know, taxpayers funded these research. So he wanted everyone to have the right to have access to it, no matter how much money they were making and whatnot. And what happened was that he was then, they, the CFA basically was used against him and that they wanted to put him in jail for 35 years and also to pay a $1 million fine. And so what ended up happening was because there was no end in sight and he was overwhelmed and there was no set date and he didn't know which way this was going to go, unfortunately, he hung himself um, because of it. And it's one of those things that showcases that the CFA has written. You can stack upon stack years and, and funds. On, on one single action that you have done, um, and which is really disturbing. And that's why like, whenever I talk about CFA and when people are like, oh, we don't need to revisit that. If we don't need to care about that, I'm like, look up Aaron Swartz's case. But there's a it's lot of people that like those laws to be as huge and as encompassing as they possibly can, yeah. um, because it's no longer an issue about clarity, it's an issue of power. And well, we call those people I lawyers. Have. Yeah. And that's that's the one thing, because in 2013, 
legislators came together to try to pass this thing called Aaron's Law, which was a reaction to Aaron Swartz's case that would basically bring amendments to the CFAA so they wouldn't be able to stack on top stack anymore. Um, and so one of the things, though, was that it didn't go further because of these big corporations had lobbyists. And these lobbyists were very much against any amendments to CFA because they need something in place that if an employee does something wrong with what they are, their everyday job or do something that they're not supposed to, that they can still use it against their employee or I would say more like former employee. Right. That's why. But yeah. I think a lot of this I saw over your shoulder there, uh, CJ. Uh, the lurkers. Yeah, yeah. that's Rick and uh, David just, you know, because we're all together here violating quarantine. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We're, we're trying. Well, there he is. That's a real person. That's not. It's, it's, it's video bombing is what this is. Well, look, Fletch. there's another person. <laughs> yeah, that's Fletch. I don't know what Fletch is doing in that part of the country, but. Party uh, Visiting. So, visiting. Yeah, I almost visited, but anyway. The, Another question I wanted to ask, kind of like, kind of keep this on on this topic, and kind of a point is, I really don't think that a lot of people in security quite understand that what happened to Aaron could absolutely happen to them, and it's also one of the reasons, you know, whenever you're looking at a lot of vendors, uh, for example, years ago, Silence wasn't treating security researchers very well at all. There's always that threat of, you know, we're, we're going to press charges against you, we're going to do these things against you, and you're just doing your job finding vulnerabilities in the software. I, I think that a lot of a lot of people in this industry need to understand that this can happen and we always need to be constantly fighting against it because it is absolutely something that it just takes one case where someone says, well, you wrote open source backdoors, or you wrote open source vulnerability software, or you wrote an exploit and submitted its Metasploit and then that hacked somebody and then they decided to sue you. Just takes that happening once and it basically shuts down our entire industry almost overnight. Yep. And that that's the whole thing is that I, I started doing this kind of talk. So I started doing talks around Safe Harbor and Disclose.io when I used to work at Bug Crowd because I realized that a lot of the bug bounty hunters were not aware of the CFA or knew too much about the legal ramifications that if they go out of scope. And you do see people in bug bag go out of scope and not exploit. But the thing is, is like they need to be aware that even going out of scope puts them in a situation that even when you're within scope, it can put you in a situation and they need to be aware of it. And that's the one thing I don't think. I think a lot of people, when they go into hacking, they're like this is the coolest thing ever. But they don't think about, hey, you need to know these things. You need to know where we stand in the current landscape because you can go into falling into a trap. And that's going to be very, very hard for you because we have seen what happens to people when they get into that trap. It's very hard. Yeah, I think a lot of these problems also come down to having people in power who are somewhat technology, technological literate. Um, yeah. I think that's that's the root cause of a lot of these issues because it's also like, sure, advisors are great and all, and that's what they're for. But I, I do think there is a definite definite difference between actually the person in power understanding something as opposed to hearing it regurgitated from an advisor, I think it, I think it really, I, I, there's, I think there's a, there's a big difference in that. And I think that that should, we should definitely be looking forward to doing that a lot more, at least yeah. in America. I'm not sure how it that works is, in the European that Union. Is, I think that's definitely true. Oh, right. oh, I was just going to say that when I went to DC last year, I found out that is a very true statement that there are many people in legislation that don't know technology well at all. And if they don't know technology well at all, chances are they don't really know too much about InfoSec either. And that's a scary thing. Like I heard a politician talking about 5G, 5G, just talking about 5G being the worst thing that's ever happened to security. And I was just sitting there like, what? <laughs> Well, I heard that's it gives not, everyone coronavirus. That's what I heard. Yeah, I, that's what I heard, well, too. That's, this is not an uncommon problem. This exists in every field. Everything is more complex than politicians understand. So we're, yeah. computer security is not alone in this challenge. Politicians don't understand medicine. They don't understand highway safety. They don't. I, I, admittedly, this is more complex. 
But yeah. I was struck by something when you were talking about terminology earlier, something about medical terminology, like how critically that Im- important that is to doctors, right? That's the way they quickly and efficiently communicate and avoid confusion. And it takes a lot of training for them to get there. But just on your terms about hacker, reclaiming the hacker term, it was 15, 20 years ago when I was reading about the difference between hacker and a cracker. But the term cracker just never caught on, right? And how do you drive that? And it occurred to me that one of the ways to drive that, Chloe, is if you can get to the New York Times editorial section of the AP, whoever has those, those, those definitions of what words are proper, like we need, and you're kind of fighting for this, that same status for use the right word. A hacker is not a criminal. And that's, I mean, that's your, your essential point. But if you can get the term cracker to come back, I don't, I doubt it, but. So I, I'm so glad you brought that up. That is something that I'm working on right now with my co-founder, Brian, for Hacking is Not a Crime. We are working on submitting a letter to all the top editorials, such as New York Times, AP, and whatnot. But before we send it out, we also want people to sign it too. So then the more signatures we have of the community, the better. And of course, we can always add the petition that I wrote at the end of February to attach that so they have a better idea of why we're taking this stance right now. So yeah, well, we, we post we, that link up. We can get 550 signatures right here, I think. That would be uh, great. Yeah, we're right now. Say. Yeah, definitely. I can definitely share in Discord. But yeah, please do that. Yeah, I can do it right now. Hold on. Let me By the way, post it to Discord. We'll steal it. We'll put it on, on all our webcasts for a while and stuff. Thank we you. did a fantastic job. Thank you for sticking on a little bit longer, Chloe, and uh, doing the, the, the monkey dance with all of us, trying to pretend like <laughs> we're your professionals knowing what we're doing here. Um, oh, we're killing, killing an extra 15, 20 minutes. So, yeah, so we're going to, you just saw Kent and Jordan just jumped on. And they also want me to mention uh, in our Discord channel, we also have the hiring village. So check that out. You can go in there and post like LinkedIn and Twitter profiles, as well as like any job openings or anything like that that you're curious about as well. But I'll probably kind of turn it over to, to Kent and Jordan here in a little bit. Do we want to Do we want to have you guys get started any earlier or do you guys need any extra time was, or? I think we should oh, we start don't. on. No, we're no, good. I don't, want, I don't want anybody. That was brilliant. Yeah, we don't yeah, want to yeah. step on, on track two's talk. They probably have somebody over there. So, well, and, I, and, and after we started talking about it, after after you were done, Chloe, I was like, yeah, this probably shouldn't have been just a 15 minute talk. There's no. like a oh. <laughs> I did the 15 minute version of it earlier, like I think an hour and a half ago or something, or two hours. Yeah, we'll <laughs> yep. That's brilliant research. You could have uh, talked so slow, Chloe. You could have been like, I know, I feel bad. I know, I could have been a slot. Was there anything that you feel like you skipped over that you wish you couldn't have? Because we got five more minutes here. All all I got to say is like, honestly, people check out hackingisnotacrime.org. Find out if you want to become an advocate or volunteer your time, do so. Like we're here. And the reason this was created was a one-stop shop for every hacker in the community to know what to do next and how to participate, how to give back to your community. Because that's what we are, we're a community, we're very close to each other and we should support each other. But yeah. Uh, my favorite t-shirt I've ever seen, Katie had this years ago. It said, hate the bug, not the researcher. I hate the vulnerability, not the vulnerability researcher. And I think that we constantly lose sight of that. I'm like a lot of these people that are doing this research, they're explorers, right? They're finding these things, they're sharing it. And the reason why is they want the crap to get fixed. Yep. And I think it's just an easy way to blame that person for doing that research when, you know, at the end of the day, we just got to remember that things are only fragile till they break and then we, we make them strong. Go, go back to the medical theme and say, if you want to outlaw medical research too, because sometimes that gets used to make uh, biological weapons. Yep. Yeah. It's not a good reason to outlaw it, is it? In my view, in the age of COVID, I don't think that's the thing we want to do. Well, we definitely have seen more attacks on hospitals and like databases mm-hmm. that contain your health records this year than ever before. And there's CTI leak that's been trying to do whatever they can to, you know, assist in that situation. So if you guys want to volunteer on that, check out CTI leak. But there's so many great organizations that we just we're all coming together now to push forward. And I think the thing that unites us all right now is that Van Buren case. That's a very big deal. Yeah, that one's that one's no bueno. So, all right, well, we'll, we'll, 
so much. And um, okay. we hope to get you back for San Diego and, and for next year. This might be something that we just need to set up as a workshop uh, yeah. where we can all get together oh, yeah. and we can talk about it. It'll seem like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's like, my name is John. I've been a hacker for 20 years, only not really. Now I just do PowerPoint. Hi, John. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. I love how Kent and Jordan are trying to get their mood lighting going. So. Oh, wait. Well, you guys have the link. I put it in the <laughs> chat. And I'll also put it in the, ch in the track Discord. But I'm around. If anyone needs anything, I am around on Discord. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, you guys, again. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.